Okay, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're actually missing one panelist, but uh, Sean hopefully will uh, will walk in here soon. Are you coming to repair me? Because you're going to be here a while if you're trying to repair me. Good. We're good. No? Yes. Hey, there we go. You can have your microphone back. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get uh, get rolling here. So uh, we'll take, uh, you know, a minute apiece or, or so forth uh, for you to do an intro of yourself. Sean, hopefully, will he's actually at the conference, but he's just not in the room, which tells you we're not that important to him. Um, but, uh, but hopefully, Sean will step in here and, uh, and give us a, a little uh, dive of, of who he is and, and what he's involved in as well. Uh, but we'll go ahead and start uh, with Mark. Uh, my name is Mark Velker, and I mostly came here to heckle Sean. Um, so uh, I work at Cisco. I'm a technical lead on our OpenSec at Cisco team. Uh, I also uh, founded the uh, meetup in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, um, which is about 450 some members now. Um, we in about a little less than two years. Um, and I also work on, I'm a core developer on the Puppet Stack Forge projects. Um, I touch a bunch of other uh, things related to OpenSec at Cisco as well. All right, so uh, I'm uh, Scott Lowe. I work at VMware um, in the uh, Network and Security Business Unit with a focus on OpenStack and other open source projects. Um, I, I worked closely with Shannon to establish a, uh, a meetup group in the Denver, Colorado area. And we're at, uh, I don't know, probably 250, 275 uh, members right now, uh, some of thereabouts. Um, I'm involved in um, contributing to OpenStack um, docs um, both through a book sprint that I participated back in the summer and then um, also uh, contributing to some of the other um, documentation as well. Cool. Uh, my name is Shannon McFarland. I'm a principal engineer at Cisco Systems focused on OpenStack. And uh, along with Scott, we've, we've co-founded a, a meetup group uh, out of Denver. And so this is a, a panel session that we've done for several years now, I think. We did one in Hong Kong and, uh, and I think uh, way back as far as maybe even uh, San Diego. So... Um, this is a, a pretty good opportunity for those of you, especially we find these are actually more popular outside the U.S. because the U.S. seems to be somewhat um, uh, almost overblown with meetups in some of the marketplaces. Uh, but a lot of people that are in different geographies are looking for a way to either link up with an existing group around OpenStack or start their own user group around OpenStack. And so we, uh, we tend to kind of you know, do a few opening questions uh, that, that we, we talk about around, you know, kind of how we started and what are the tools and, and tips and tricks that we went through to, to get uh, a good popular uh, meetup or, or user group going. And so we'll start with those. We've got microphones in the area. Uh, so please step up and interrupt us with questions or we'll, we'll end the session with, uh, you know, any, any types of Q&A that you guys have on that, okay? So... Um, We'll start off with, with, you know, what are some of the tips in finding OpenStack meetups? I mean, you know, I think that, that very often a lot of us will live in a, in a geography around the world where we may not know that there's a meetup already going on in there. And so is there, a, you know, a, an easy way? Is there a, a user group? Is it just, you know, hitting Google? Is it, you know, just going to a meetup group? Um, you know, what are some of the best ways of, of finding an existing meetup? Um, so the OpenStack Foundation actually has a listing of meetup groups on the website. Um, if you click on community on the first page, then hey, there he is. Uh, then you'll find your way there pretty quickly. They've actually got an interactive map as well. Um, so you can actually just sort of move that around to where your area is and find one near you. Um, they also have an alphabetical listing as well. Um, one thing I'll say, though, is that if there's not an OpenStack meetup group specifically in your area, you may find that there's, uh, say, a cloud computing group that actually talks a lot about OpenStack or a DevOps group, or, or one of the related, uh, related fields near you. All right, I'll let Sean introduce himself real quick, and then we can go from there. Yeah, sorry I got lost. <laughs> I guess everyone's had that experience now. Uh, Sean Roberts, VMware. Um, I run the San Francisco Bay Area user group, um, OpenStack ambassador. So Sam. the question was tools to help people find a meetup. To help people find a meetup. Um, okay, so the the. Oh, no, I didn't hear what you guys said, so I don't want to necessarily repeat <laughs> what you just said. Sorry, but I I guess. Yeah, Mark, Mark yeah. plug the community and user groups website. Is there you know other alternative approaches that may I mean because there's sometimes people don't register their user groups with uh, OpenStack.org. So is there an easier way to to find them? 
Yeah, so um, Meetup has become, meetup.com has become kind of the de facto standard by implementation, but um, it's not by all means the only one. But uh, there are plenty of user groups on there that aren't actually registered um, or uh, documented in the community page like they should be. So if you just go to meetup.com and um, search on OpenStack, you'll find a whole bunch of uh, new and uh, new groups. Um, there is a few countries where Meetup's not available, so unfortunately, that's you're gonna have to rely on uh, the the more organized version that's on the OpenStack page. Because Meetup's which, not available. Which in leads my to my very next question. Well done, Sean. Of if I if I don't want to use Meetup, or if, you know, if I can't use Meetup, you know, because of just site restrictions or whatever, are there other common you know approaches uh, that that typical user groups would would use around you know is it just facebook or something else that i can use to kind of help organize yeah so i've seen um groups uh, like uh, i think the vietnam group is set up this way um, google groups or facebook or both so um i think personal you know whichever your personal preference is um, i would prefer if i wasn't going to use meetup because meetup isn't my favorite, but it's the best one available. Um, Google Groups would be my se second option, my second choice. Okay, great. So if uh, if I didn't find a meetup and I actually wanted to, to organize one on my own, what's, um, you know, one of the, the common problems that we have even in, in established areas that aren't maybe in the valley or something like that is, uh, you know, how do I begin finding sponsors that can help uh, you know, it could be just as much as, you know, a sponsor that comes in and provides food and, and a speaker, or it could be something more logistical around, you know, an actual location to have my meetup. So what have you, you guys kind of found that, that works there? Well, I think that, um, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges that we still haven't, to my satisfaction, at least adequately addressed in, in Denver is, and, and I think this is one that is critical for really building a, a membership, and that is a, a routine meeting location and a routine meeting time. Like, we're always gonna meet here and we're always gonna meet on the third Wednesday of the month or whatever, whatever that is, right? Because that gives people consistency if they know, hey, it's, uh, it's coming up, um, you know, I know it's gonna happen on this day, I can go ahead and put it on my calendar, I know it's gonna be here, I can plan around that. Um, so we, we've had some challenges within the Denver area of just getting that um, established as, as well as we would like. Um, we're, we're getting there, but... Uh, Aside from that, I you know we use Meetup.com. Like I said, uh, I'll, I'll echo Sean's comments. It's not great, but it will get the job done to kind of broadcast the presence, um, make contacts within the industry, people that we know at organizations. Uh, we tap our own organization to help out when we can, uh, that sort of thing. But um, you know, aside from that, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Um, so we found that once you've had just one or two meetups, then um, you'll actually start getting volunteers uh, contacting you. Um, so I think in the past month, we've had um, three different companies volunteer to send folks out to RTP. Um, so just holding one or two um, is, a, is a decent way to get started before finding sponsors. And that can be fairly simple. Um, you can start, you know, um, maybe get in your own office to house a few folks because your first meetup is probably not going to be thousands of people. Um, unless you live in a, a really big place. Um, or you can go to a restaurant, go to a bar, um, go to a picnic at the park, um, just as long as you are meeting to talk about OpenStack. Um, and the content can be pretty lightweight too. Um, one of the sort of challenges that we have in RTP is that we have people from all different sides of OpenStack. So we have people whose day job is OpenStack development, and we have people who are um, brand new to cloud computing in general and just want to find out what all the buzz is about. Um, so finding content that addresses all those different audiences is sometimes challenging, so we try to rotate through those topics. And some of the, the kind of introductory 101 sort of talks are probably going to be pretty easy for you if you're um, starting a new meetup group, because um, obviously you probably know a thing or two about uh, OpenStack at that point. Um, and once you kind of get that ball rolling, um, that, that's one good way to help attract sponsors pretty quickly. Um, and I'll, I'll also say, once you do get the ball rolling, talk to the people that are in your group, because um, a lot of times you can kind of poke them into getting them uh, personally or their employers to uh, send folks out to, to do sponsorship for you or help you with meeting locations. So um, I, I, we're pretty lucky where I am. There's sponsor options. In fact, I'm constantly having to tell people no that we don't have a, a way of um, receiving their money or whatever they're offering, which is kind of a weird problem to have. So um, in other areas, um, 
I, the people I've talked to, um, and some of them, they've started their own groups, and I don't even think they publish them. They just meet on their own. It's generally around universities, um, and it seems to be pretty successful. So, um, so if you wanted to start a user group, um, that would be one of the ways because it um, to get it going. Because in my experience, the hardest part, um, like when I left Yahoo, I lost the space because they weren't interested in continuing to support the user groups, unfortunately. Um, so I had needed to find a new space. So that was the very, very, very first thing I needed to lock down. So I, HP was kindly enough, and they've offered it. I'm probably going to start holding my VMware as well, although the location isn't as ideal because it's, uh, you know, it might as well be 50 miles away <laughs> during traffic time. Yeah. So, um, so the location being easy but also consistent is really important. Um, and we're we, lucky enough we're uh, able to stick to the same schedule because uh, um, uh, people just show up now. To, they know where, when to show up. So, um, so the sponsorship of the the actual physical location, I think, is the most critical. The other things. I mean, people don't absolutely have to be fed. You know, they need lights on, they need Wi-Fi, but that usually comes to the building. Um, you have to negotiate the security with the people that um, you have the building. So if you can lock down the building, then it seems like other things kind of just happen. So. It, just to uh, piggyback on one point, I think you both said that uh, location consistency was actually important. Right. That may actually, that your mileage may vary a little bit with that, depending on where you are. Um, in RTP, we've, we've actually pretty consistently held them at the Cisco office in RTP. Um, and we're actually considering changing that up and, and moving it around a little bit because RTP happens to be really three cities in the same general area. So we have a very spread out population. Um, so it actually might make sense for us to, you know, we might get a few more folks from the Durham side of town if we actually held something in Durham or downtown in Raleigh or, or wherever. Yeah, we have taken that approach in Denver. Uh, Denver, not quite as spread out as RTP. I used to live there, so <laughs> familiar with it. But we do even uh, run into people who might live on the north side of a of the metro area who would prefer to go there and don't want to drive down to the south side, or somebody who lives on the south side doesn't want to drive the north side. And so we've bounced back and forth, and I'm I, I'm yet to determine whether that consistency. I feel like the consistency of having one location that is reasonably convenient for everybody would actually help. But we have done the back and forth, and I'm not. I'm. I'm a little undecided. I don't know, Shannon, if you want to weigh in on that or, or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the. It, again, I've talked to several people over the last several, you know, panels that we've done on this topic afterwards, and I mean, some of them are in very, very small, you know, townships or city geographies. So it's it's location is just get me a place where I can put someone and, and what, you know, they found out as they started off at a local coffee shop and then they realized that there is a truckload of people in their community that care or want to care about OpenStack and that very quickly blows out, you know, the location that they have. So I think, you know, in some of the larger geographies where you end up actually having multiple, kind of like we do with, with Colorado with, with uh, Dave Medbury, where we actually have more than one OpenStack meetup going on uh, in the area. So I think a lot of it is, is based upon geography of you know where that that problem uh you know is a result and i think you know feeding into the next question is um how do you support remote audiences and you know like scott and i have have had you know denver's a very transient area so we have a lot of people that live there that don't work there um, and so you might have a really large number of RSVPs for a particular topic, and then when it comes time to see them in person, you have a small fraction of that number that actually uh, shows up. So, you know, it's a two-part question for you guys is, one, what is the, you know, the common way that you deal with remote audiences or recording of your sessions? Is it just Google Hangouts or GoToMeeting or WebEx? Um, and the second part of that question is, do you think providing live remote attendance actually negatively impacts your live in-person attendance? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we've experimented with, um, I've got some friends in India and Germany and a few other places that are all in crazy time zones compared uh, in comparison to where I am. So um, that's caused a significant, well, let me put it a different way. Any, any, additional thing that you introduce to a meeting, whether it be, you know, for business or for whatever, it just makes it more complicated. So you add WebEx or you add Google Hangout or you add microphones or a camera or waiting for a second speaker or a fourth in my case. Um, it just makes everything more complicated and more likely that something will go wrong and you won't be able to actually get to what you're trying to get to. Um, we, we started doing um, training 
um, as part of the as part of the focus because that was consistently what people were coming up and asking for. So we actually started a project around it and then we started actually um, just recently started making one of the team members started making videos. So we're thinking about as part of the user group um, co-op or not thinking we're going to start co-opting um, our normal user group time on our Thursdays that we always hold it and we're going to hold six sessions but we're also going to record them. So we're going to We'll, we'll report back to see how successful and what happens, but it's uh, basically using the training material that we've built, and uh, but it's exactly the same time, doing pretty much the same thing people have been asking for, because they consistently show up and they're asking questions about how do I learn about, usually pretty basic stuff about OpenStack. So um, by using this, I think, hopefully, that this will serve the the people's needs that are showing up, and the videos will be an extra, So, but they'll be canned, they won't be live. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we've uh, used WebEx uh, to provide that remote uh, component, and it's been <sighs> moderately successful. I mean, there's always the added complexity to echo Sean's comment, you know, of trying to get signed into the WebEx and making sure they can hear you, and, uh, you know, is the display working correctly? Can you see my slides, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and I do think that there's, especially when you get into the larger geographies where maybe going to the other side of town is a little too complex or a little too much time or too much traffic, like in the Bay Area, right? Um, that having that remote option does impact negatively the face-to-face -face interaction. Um, but I'm, I'm on the fence as to whether that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, part of the purpose of a user group is to just connect with other people. That connection doesn't necessarily have to be face-to-face, -face, although that's ideal to form relationships, but part of it is just to facilitate communication. Yeah, I'll kind of echo that. We've, we've been doing WebEx recordings for all of our stuff as well, and we generally get not very many people attending those live, um, and probably even fewer people playing them back later. Um, but it's, it's kind of a lifesaver for those people who had that thing come up at the office at the end of the day and couldn't make it over. Um, so we've gotten some positive feedback on that. It is generally less interactive for those folks. Um, you know, out of, maybe because of the technology or, or maybe just because of where they are, they don't feel like asking questions a lot. So it tends to be kind of one way. Um, so it's, it's been beneficial. I don't know that it's um, been great. Um, you know, we, we could probably do without it if, if it came to that. And I probably wouldn't worry a tremendous amount if for some reason I couldn't make it work one night. Um, but it's been a plus. I, I do want to say that um, we've held uh, what we called beginner sessions for about the last year, and Mirantis has been nice enough to lend us their trainers, um, and um, it's usually one of their new newer trainers that's learning, which is awesome. Um, and we're giving them a service, and they're helping us out at the same time. And uh, usually, we'll have anywhere from 80 to 150 people show up. Um, we've held them once a month. We were holding them every two weeks, and that was too much. But uh, when we do that, and we um, always run WebEx, we usually have anywhere from uh, 10 to 20 people join. But it, it's really hard to tell because of the lack of feedback how, if they're actually just kind of listening to it in the background, or they got in and it didn't work for them and they just didn't jump off, or because I've gotten a variety of feedback at different times, like I can't hear you, or, or I couldn't hear you when um, I didn't know to use a chat window. So, uh, you know, I. It wasn't useful. So, but I've also gotten feedback as well that it was really helpful. Thank you for doing that. So, it's uh, it's one of those things we we keep doing. I'm just not sure how valuable it is. But um, at at various times, it has disrupted the entire meeting, um, and we start like 20 minutes late because the person that's showing up is a new trainer and they've never set up WebEx before, and you know they're using Opera or some kind of crazy browser, and WebEx won't start on it, and they're sitting there trying to. Can I just reinstall this? <laughs> so, um, so it is one of those things that if I could avoid it, I would. But we we kind of built it into how we do things, so it's necessary evil. But one of the things I've tried to do it hasn't been 100% successful. I try to get whoever's going to be talking to show up like a half hour early, so we can run through the audio visual and all the the extra stuff that always kerfuffles everything. Yeah, so. I mean, I think it goes back again to the logistics of the location because if you're having it at a coffee shop or a bar. Um, you know, you've got to bring your own projector. They're not providing that or, you know, everybody's crowded around holding a beer, spilling it on your keyboard while they stare at your keyboard, you know, your screen or whatever. But 
then trying to engage into whatever the local Wi-Fi is, which is hard enough to do sometimes at an established corporate location um, where you're using it, much less, you know, you're doing it at a restaurant or, you know, wherever you may be hosting the event. So I think that, uh, you know, it, it ends up being a struggle no matter if it's established or not, uh, just because of the logistics part of that. I've come to the realization that running these meetings, you're, you're acting as a trainer. You're giving a service to people that are showing up, and whether or not you intended it to be that way, you're teaching them. And maybe you have a variety of speakers, but you're, you're facilitating training for them. So to do that, trainers have a lot of background and you know, preparation they have to do. So if you don't do that, it's... it's it good. shows, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, a uh, question? Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, there are very various uh, user groups now, some of them are uh, quite set up, and some of them are new coming, new coming there well. So how does the new coming user groups uh, share their experiences with the uh, set up uh, user groups so that they can evolve and uh, get better? And how, that, how does the settled up user groups uh, can transfer their knowledge to the new coming user groups? Yeah. Thanks. Mentoring kind of thing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Got the mic, so I'll say it again, I guess. Um, so yeah, we've struggled with this. There's actually the ambassadors team. Um, there's going to be a, a talk. I should know this off the top of my head, but there's going to be an ambassadors talk, which is kind of like a, a, a different set of the user groups um, globally. Um, so uh, we've talked about how we need to mentor, or how we could mentor other user groups and, um, and facilitate the, the user group experience the community worldwide. Um, I hadn't thought of a mailing list for user groups, but ac that actually would, I think, would be the solution. Um, and it's pretty easy to set up. Uh, we do have an ambassador's mailing list, but it's it's not quite the same thing. So um, yeah, I think we should just do that. Just create a, a user OpenStack user groups mailing list and and advertise it on the user group page and tell everyone else and start doing that. No, it doesn't exist, but you just gave me the idea to do it, so let's do it. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think the user group mailing list is a great idea, so we should, you know, whoever, kind of, I guess you could facilitate that as an ambassador. But I, in the short term, if you wanted to well, use... Right okay, awesome. <laughs> in the short term, I, I would say we could probably use um, one of the generic OpenStack mailing lists. Um, not, not the dev, but... Um, Maybe operator. Yeah. Um, you know, to, yeah, just to try and get that communica communication out um, to other people. Uh, but I think that a, a dedicated mailing list or, or, you know, even if we wanted to try and set up an IRC channel, um, that might be an option as well. Uh, we could, I, I think we could just use, uh, for, for IRC, we could just, um, well, actually, there's a community time for, uh, it's usually not um, Stefano, Stefano, I'll get his name right one of these days. Um, he runs the uh, community. Um, he he's tech, he's in charge. He's a one of the community managers, and he's uh, generally available during the community hours. It's actually posted as a uh, one of the IRC meets. So if you were to show up and say, put your hand up and say, "Hey, are we going to still have the meeting?" He'd be there. Um, I'd like us to do it more often. So um, so actually, that's probably it. We probably don't need a new one. We just use the community mailing list. That would be probably the best because that's already very similar. Um, so, yeah, I think we should do that rather than creating a new one. Yeah, and I'll just say the other piece is um, look around for user groups that are either near you or look like yours. Um, you know, maybe a user group that has a high concentration of, of newer users or one that's in a rural area or, or an urban area or whatever it is. Um, and talk to those organizers. The organizers of the meetups are usually pretty approachable people because, um, you know, we're all dealing with a couple hundred uh, members, <laughs> so um, we have to have some people skills, I guess. Um, but we're we're generally pretty approachable, and if there's anything that we can do to help, we're generally pretty pretty re willing to to do that. Does that answer your question? Cool. So uh, on to topics. I mean, I think uh, you know both uh, Mark and and Sean have kind of led into this a little bit, but uh, you know a lot of the meetups that you attend are you know depending on the geography are very vendor specific. Um, just because they happen to be sponsoring or so forth. I think Scott and I have a pretty 
hard and fast rule of just because you're sponsoring doesn't mean you're going to pitch to us, right? And so, so that's a very important differentiator. But, you know, outside of that, and, and you know, I think uh, people, you know, generally after a summit are usually, or after, you know, a, the Kilo release, for example, people, you know, some, the PTL or a core, somebody comes in and does kind of an update of, of what's happening in that release. Um, you know, what, you know, from a community perspective, can we do as a better job of just promoting general education? And it could be, you know, you know to the, the point that you've been driving at, Sean, around uh, leveraging the existing, you know, the existing training guides, and we have a URL here for the, the training guides. Um, you know, is there a way for us to use those training guides in a, in a meetup or user group environment so that we could actually, you know, maybe every other week or so forth, you know, present some sort of 101 or a developer's guide or, or something like that? So what are your ideas about, you know, other types of content? Actually, I just well, part of the reason I was late is because I just came from talking about exactly this. So, good timing. Um, so, the <clears throat> excuse me, the training guides um, project is part of the docs program, um, and uh, that was primarily just because it's documentation. But it's uh, evolved far beyond that already. Um, Stefano and uh, <clears throat> Luik Drakny have. Uh, um, spun up uh, an outgrowth of the upstream university that Luik started. Um, it's now been kind of co-opted and being called upstream training, and it's um, the second version of it just happened uh, or happen, happened uh, two days before the summit. It was advertised as part of the um, foundation materials. Um, so it's it's been very um, focused on two-day training on uh, teaching OpenStack, um, a little bit from a developer perspective more from a developer perspe perspective. Um, and the training guides are more around uh, teaching user groups. So we're talking about co-opting both those efforts and actually uh, merging them together where we start producing primarily slide content um, for self, uh, around being self-taught, but also uh, being able to run them uh, specifically in the user groups. So we're doing the first uh, release of this or the first implementation in San Francisco. Um, we talked about maybe doing it in other places as well, and I'm happy to actually, maybe we should talk right after this and talk about what we talked about. Um, so I, I think with their help, um, we can actually start producing a lot more content um, and allow the user groups that are um, have specific focus, maybe on Neutron or maybe on Salometer, or whatever it happens to be, they can start producing their own content and feed it back into the system, and then other user groups could use it, because that's... Um, it seems like the interest is there because people are giving talks. Um, people are talking specifically about different features, and essentially what they're doing is teaching. So let's capture that and allow other people to use it and build upon it. So Yeah, I mean, it. I think, you know, with the training guides, I mean, I think some of the feedback has been, man, the training guides are great for me if I'm consuming it through a browser. But if I actually want to reteach that, you know, can I consume it through a PDF or a keynote or a PowerPoint presentation? How do we... How do we kind of convert that? Because that's a lot of work, right? To you know, to get that into that particular format. So, you know, in, any input that you have on, you know, if there's any plans around that, uh, you know, you know, stuff that, like for example, in your group, you know, the Morantis folks are actually doing 101 level stuff. So that's Morantis intellectual property that they're reusing for that. But is, are there any plans to like, you know, you know, do a presentation version of the training guides or no? That's actually exactly what we were just talking about, that it's been too focused on docs, too little on actually delivering the content. So we're, we're talking about, right now, all the data is stored in XML, um, and it's uh, pushed up by patches just like any, any other um, OpenStack project. Um, we're talking about actually switching it around and moving it all into a simpler format called RST, um, and, um, which is the format that the upstream training is using. And uh, it's primarily meant to be easy to generate slides. There's a little bit of code around actually um, publishing the slides in, in HTML. And they look, um, it's using landscape, which is basically nothing more than an easy way of using, converting from RST to HTML and PDF. So, um, so we're gonna start focusing more on that and, um, and Gentle and uh, 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 Matt and a few of the other guys, Andreas, that are in the docs team are gonna help us start to reformat just slightly some of the material they have so we can reuse it easier. But the primary focus would be to produce slides so they can be used to teach, so. 
Awesome. Okay, so to follow up on that one, and again, Mike's for those of you that have questions here, uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of the resources around the meetups have been, um, again, you know, it's either vendor specific or, or, you know, people are just, you know, using content that's already out there, but a lot of the the you know meetups that that i've talked to and scott and i have, have kicked this around a lot is like trying to move into you know lab oriented hands-on type of stuff so you know there's a couple of ways that people have been doing this you know a lot of the you know the larger geographies you know some vendor has coughed up some public lab space where they can do you know a trial edition of their online uh, OpenStack environment where people can go through and create a network and do some some uh, stuff. And then the other side of that is, you know, walking through everybody, you know, getting together and having, you know, VirtualBox and Vagrant and, and, you know, some sort of distro that they deploy that they learn from. So if you guys kind of found, you know, which one of those ways is the most flexible and, you know, easy from a lab perspective to, to get people started on the hands-on or, or are they kind of equal either way? Uh, I think there, there's pros and cons. We've done, um, I think, one one of each of those. Um, Red Hat sponsored some lab time for us over at the Red Hat Tower in downtown Raleigh, and we also had another uh, demo that actually had people installing stuff on their laptops. Um, so there's pros and cons. The, the good thing about going to a, a lab space is the environment's already controlled, contained, set up, and you can kind of hit the ground running and go. Um, and you don't have to worry about, you know, do you have the right software prerequisites installed and all that kind of thing, or, or can your laptop even get on the Wi-Fi? Um, the downside is that people can't take it home afterwards. Um, so, you know, they, they kind of come for their hour or two and, and do what they can do, and then that's it. Um, and it's kind of hard for them to take that home and keep, keep messing with it. Um, so, you know, um, I would say neither one is ideal, um, and we've done both, and that's probably the best approach because I think different audiences are going to get different things out of it. Yeah, this is something we're still wrestling with in Denver, obviously, as you know, Shannon. Um, and, and so thus far, we've done some... You know, demos, hosted stuff. Um, <laughs> use my home lab <laughs> for some stuff, yeah. right? Um, but I think in the long term, uh, we're, we're probably better off, to, to Mark's point, of enabling the attendees to continue to do this on their own. Um, so I, I think that us looking at, you know, perhaps as a, as a broader community effort of publishing Vagrant files and, and, and the appropriate boxes to actually allow them to set up a small environment that they could run on their laptop um, without a great deal of effort um, would probably be the best approach because it does allow them to come to the, the meetup, uh, talk with others, ask them questions. Oh, I tried this, it didn't work. What do I do now, da, da, da. Uh, the, you know, get some feedback and then they can take it away and say, uh, go home, work on it, come back the next time. Hey, I figured this out, this is what I did, that kind of thing. Sure, I mean, I think, you know, if you look at the beginning of each of the training guide sections, there's a, uh kind of a, you know, a topology of what this looks like. These are the IP addresses and you can go through that. And so I think that if we, if we you, know, you know, kind of pre-canned what it would look like to build a topology on your local you know, uh, machine and then jump into the training guides directly from there, everyone's operating the same way. It would be very helpful to your point of if everyone was working from the same training guides using the same tool set, when you came in, you know, encountered a problem, when we hit the mailer or something like that, everybody knows what type of environment that everyone else is using. So I think, you know, there's a lot of pros to us backing, you know, the training guide material and, and orchestrating the, the actual tool set that we would do from a hands-on perspective based on that. And right now, um, there's, um, obviously it's not, well, not maybe not obvious, but by H, uh, HTTP, you can't get access to the scripts, but in the GitHub repo for um, training guides, um, stackforge da slash um, training guides, uh, no, it's not stackforge, it's OpenStack. <laughs> OpenStack slash training guides. Um, you'll find that there's um, uh, what we're calling OS bash scripts, which are to run VirtualBox to create um, a four node install. Um, and uh, some of the guys um, um, have started using those virtual machines and importing them into uh, Glance um, with uh, pretty good success so far. Uh, and, and also for running the training, uh, we're talking about the logistics of having that set up before somebody shows up, because otherwise 15 minutes, if you're lucky, to get that all set up. So we're, for actually running the training, we're talking about um, using Rackspace developer um, VM space so we can set it up the week before and possibly reuse it as well. Um, but for people that want to be self-taught, they can build their own environment using the VirtualBox scripts. 
no less bash setup. Awesome. Question? Hi. This is a little bit off topic, but just wondering what you do at Cisco and VMware to internalize evangel inter internally evangelize and uh, generate some more interest around OpenStack. So um, th I guess there's a couple things. One is um, we at Cisco actually host internal conferences about this kind of stuff. So um, this coming January, we're actually hosting sort of a Cisco internal version of the OpenStack Summit. Um, just get our own developers excited about it because we have so many different projects that touch OpenStack in some way, shape, or form now. Um, and for the meetup groups specifically, we, we try to advertise those word of mouth around campus. We kind of have um, sort of the email list equivalent of an office water cooler. Um, so you know, we try to send, send things around to that and, and uh, just get people excited about it. Um, word of mouth is actually pretty powerful for us as well. Uh, I think we're about 6,000 employees in, in the RTP campus, and you'd be surprised how fast word of mouth can spread through a group that big. Um, so, um, yeah, and we created a, a mailer, I mean, probably nearly three years ago now called OpenStack-Interest, and it's not people that maybe even will do OpenStack as any real part of their job, but they're interested in it, and so it's, it's crazy how many seed questions of just basic stuff, you know, whether it's how do I get hooked up with, with a, a meetup or something like that, all the way through where can I actually go get formal training? And, and so that's, a, that's an awesome way to, to kind of get that established inside the, inside the org. Yeah, I'll let um, uh, Sean comment as well, since he's actually in Palo Alto at, at the campus. I'm in Denver, and the nearest office is up in Broomfield, which is too much trouble for me to drive to because I'm lazy. But internally, VMware uses a, a product called SocialCast, um, which is uh, you know described as like Facebook for business. It's a type thing. And, and we uh, have established uh, groups in there that people can join the group and then see content and people will post blog posts and meetup announcements and questions and whatever else. So similar to a mailing list, but a little perhaps, perhaps, perhaps not, depending on your perspective, a little more flexible um, than that. Um, and then it's just, uh, you know, as, as they mentioned, word of mouth, you know, mentioning to, to people that you know within the organization that you are involved in OpenStack, that you are contributing to the project, that you are supporting user groups uh, via meetups and other activities, um, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know, Sean, did you want to comment at all about being in that area? Uh, so I like the idea of having an internal summit. I think I'm going to copy that. Um, now that uh, EMC and VMware and Pivotal are all hand in hand marching along, or skipping along, maybe. <laughs> um, so. Uh, but it, it, just the day-to-day -day evangelism of OpenStack, um, I just recently came over from Yahoo, so um, it's a little, little different. But um, the way I did it in Yahoo was um, there is a – I basically just started basically equivalent of a, a Yahoo user group. Um, and uh, people I knew at different departments that had interest that I'd met – through summits outside of the company, I got them together and we started meeting and working on it. And that's actually kind of how OpenStack started at Yahoo, to be perfectly honest. Um, it was more of a up um, OpenStack from the bottom up rather than the top down, or not. It, that's exactly how it started. So, um, so you could do more top down. Um, I think it's a lot more effective to do bottom up. Um, and uh, to be perfectly honest, the way I started at Yahoo finding people is um, I started searching through the OpenStack-dev mailer. And when I saw people that had Yahoo-inc email addresses, I'm like, aha. <laughs> so um, uh, in VMware, it's actually right now not much different. We're distributed uh, amongst a lot of different departments, but we all work together. Um, we don't report up through one specific person, um, and it seems to work pretty well. Um, we are starting uh, in the foundation part side of my head. Um, we're starting a uh, product management group, um, which is trying to organize the different efforts at different companies around getting the developers uh, more coordinated through the product management. And I think that might be also another backwards, uh, uh, not expected, but a way of getting those people organized within their own companies, um, forcing them to start working together more and uh, collaborating more. Because there are, these things happen, but uh, kind of due to the nature of OpenStack, they are typically from the bottom up, so that it's not organized by any one person or one uh, group. So uh, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be uh, specifically from the top down, but getting the, the product management involved seems to be the common thread. So 
that could be another way. Awesome. Well, we are, yeah, good. And you can catch us outside. Um, we're at the end of time. So um, not the actual end of time, but the end of time in this session. Um, not to cast doom on this place, but um, so we'll be here through the week and, uh, you know, contact information up there and appreciate uh, your time and, and coming to the session. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks.